For those of you who have followed my journey of building my high-end router so far, you might have noticed there weren't any significant updates for a couple of weeks now, and that's mainly because I was preoccupied with incorporation of the company uh, in the US. But that doesn't mean that no progress was made on the technical side of things. Quite the contrary. Since we're a venture capital funded company, the responsible thing to do is send out a monthly progress update to the investors, most often in the form of an email with a wall of text or, uh, as a step up, a nicely designed and organized PDF. However, as luck would have it, I do have this YouTube channel and I am getting better at storytelling by the day, so I figured, you know what, I'm gonna just do investor updates in video format and share them with you, the viewer, as well. So, where are we from a technical point of view? Well, before we get to the answer, a bit of explanation as to how PCBs are developed. First, the engineers need to draw what are known as schematics. While they can and most often do end up being quite complex, in their core they're basically just a bunch of squares connected by lines. Each square is a chip that can have from just a couple of pins and all the way to thousands of them and they all serve a particular purpose. And in order to fulfill that purpose, these pins need to be connected to, well, something else. And that something else can be a voltage to power the chip, ground, another chip, a capacitor, a resistor, you name it. And this connection is then drawn into the schematic as a simple line, which we call a net. Here's the schematic of our Gigabit Phi as an example. Below the biggest yellow box on this page, there's a marking that starts with GPY115, which is the part number for the Phi chip. I won't go too much into details at this point, but Phi is the chip that translates binary networking data, so ones and zeros, into actual electrical signals. And this is why it's followed by magnetics, and those are then routed to the RJ45 jack. The other big yellow box here on the bottom of the page is actually the very same chip, but on the schematic it's split in two in order to make this schematic more readable. The top part includes the logic or behavior of the chip, whereas the bottom part deals with power delivery for the chip, which is why there's a bunch of capacitors, both on the 3.3 power rail as well as ground. Fun fact, our CPU is split into 19 different logically organized squares because routing all 780 pins on a single sheet would be, well, messy. By the way, this chip and its behavior will get its own dedicated video in which we'll go through everything, from why this part in particular, to how it's talking to the CPU, how it's sending the data to the network, to what kind of configuration it accepts and why. So for now, this is all I'm going to share, just so that you get an idea how PCB schematic looks like if you've never seen one before. And now that you do, it's time to get back up in the overview mode for which we prepared this block diagram. For those of you who have been following my journey so far, you've probably seen a cruder version of this some months ago, but basically this is now the final version of how the device will or should look like. Let's quickly go over each component and tick off the ones for which the schematics have already been drawn and let's start at the top right where the memory is. We're planning to have four embedded memory modules with an optional ECC chip. Schematics for this part have already been drawn and we selected two possible parts so that we can end up with either 16 gigabytes of RAM or 8. All we have to do is, when it comes to production of the boards, put on the chip with half the capacity while the PCB can remain exactly the same. Let's now move forward clockwise to the next part which is called Surdi's Block 2. This will also get its own dedicated video so for now just think of it like an element that has four high-speed communication connections or lanes. As you can see here the board will feature two M.2 ports but each has a different key. This key is basically a notch on the connector that prevents us from plugging in an expansion card with a different key because the electrical wiring between the cards with different keys is not the same. For example, in your PC you probably have a couple of M.2 connectors with key M and because M stands with memory they are intended for storage slash SSDs. Key E, on the other hand, stands for Ethernet, which means you'll be able to slot in a Wi-Fi card, a Wi-Fi plus Bluetooth card, or finally a Tri-Radio card, which is Wi-Fi, Bluetooth and Thread, the new protocol for home automation. The schematic for this service block has also been drawn. Next, we have the I2C bus, which is a fairly simple communications bus, 
uh, most often used between different chips on the board that don't need a lot of bandwidth. As you can see in this diagram, we'll use it for our CPU to communicate with various sensors, clocks and to control fans for example. This part has not been drawn yet, but as far as complexity goes, this one is one of the easiest parts of the schematic, so we'll do it last probably. On the bottom of the diagram we then have our storage, which consists of two 64 megabytes NOR flash chips and a single 64 gigabyte NAND flash chip. Why so many and what's the difference you might ask? Well, the NOR flash holds something called a bootloader, which you can think of like a BIOS in your PC. It's not exactly the same, but it's close enough. Much like with other parts, we will talk about it much more in a dedicated video. For now, just think of it as a set of instructions that are passed onto the CPU and tell it how to behave and where to find the operating system. And yes, schematics for these parts have already been drawn as well. Next, we have a UART interface, and yes, this part will also get its own video, and no, schematics for this part have not been drawn yet. For now, think of the UART as a fake monitor port. I'm saying fake because you can't actually plug a monitor in, what you need to do is plug it into a free USB port on your PC or your Mac, run a particular command and you will see the output of the device on your screen and you'll be able to use your keyboard to interact with it. Obviously it's limited to just text, but you get pretty much the full administrative access to the device. So a word of caution is also in place here because it's actually possible to mess things up significantly if you don't know what you're doing. Following the UART, there's the second Surdis block, which is actually Surdis 1 as per the datasheet, and its lanes are allocated like this. First we have two separate gigabit ports, then we have two SFP plus 10 gigabit ports connected to a retimer. The primary function of this retimer is to convert between two high speed communication standards. XFI, which is what the CPU talks in, and SFI, which is what the SFP plus modules talk in. Think of it as a translator between the two, and yes, this service block has been drawn as well. We'll skip the MD bus here because it's a very simple protocol to configure and control all the Phi chips, and we haven't drawn it yet, and much like the I squared C we mentioned earlier, we'll wait until everything else is drawn up. Which then brings us to the last part of the device diagram and that are the two USB Type-C ports. Each of them serves a different purpose. One will be your standard USB port that you'll be able to plug a thumb drive in to make a backup for example, while the other will be used for power delivery, meaning the device should be compatible with a wide array of USB charging peripherals. We don't have the schematics for these yet, but are next on our to-do list as of recording of this video. Okay, recap time. We've drawn schematics for memories, M.2 slots, 3 RJ45 ports, NOR flash for bootloader and NAND flash for the operating system, and finally the two 10 gigabit SFP plus ports with a 4 channel retimer. We're now working on the power delivery and once that is done we're pretty much left with the I squared C bus and the MD bus, which combined are probably just a day or two worth of work. This means that at this point we're roughly at around 75% done when it comes to schematics and we should be fully completed by mid-June 2024. Done with the schematics that is, because what follows next is laying out these schematics on an actual PCB. Here each component needs to be placed on the PCB, inside of software that is, and each line from the schematic needs to become an actual copper trace. This episode is brought to you by PCBWay. You didn't think we're gonna do all these videos without a sponsor, did you? Anyway, I've been working with PCBWay on my custom keyboard project and I was super impressed with their speed, quality and price, so I'm more than happy to recommend them to anyone who needs any kind of PCB manufacturing done, whether it's just a couple of prototypes or if you need a larger production run. Link to their website, of course, down in the description. Back to the video. Okay, now let's talk money. Just as I expected, the first month was very purchase intensive, because in order for us to get started, and piracy is out of the question, we needed some hardware and some software. On the hardware side, we needed to buy two reference design boards, which we already received. These boards are sold by the manufacturer of the CPUs we're going to use, and are used as a sort of a showcase as to what the CPU is capable, cap capable, <laughs> capable of. They come with almost all possible connectors and ports that the CPU supports, but what's maybe even more important, schematics for these devices are completely open, 
which makes it easier for us to design or simply reuse some parts. Obviously, it's not one-on-one -on -one because we're using embedded RAM and the reference board has a discrete one. And then we're using different Phi chips from different manufacturers and we're also using USB power delivery, which the board does not. But what it does allow us, for example, is to do thermal testing, which is what I'm focusing on in the month of June. If we want our production version to be fanless, which I really, really want, then we need to stress the hell out of this board and measure its thermal output to make sure that the case we're designing can successfully absorb and dissipate the heat from the CPU and into the environment. Not only if you put the router on the shelf, but if you put it into your rack just above your several hundred watt Intel Xeon that gives away more heat than your furnace. And finally, this board will also allow us to work on firmware but this is likely several months away and we'll talk more about it when we get there. You know how much this board costs? Almost $2,000. And yes, I needed to buy two, one for me and one for Aliash. But it doesn't end there. Each board needs what is known as a programmer slash debugger. It's a device that sits between the PC and the board so that the two can communicate properly. $500 times two. But we're not there yet, not by a long shot. In fact, what I'm about to tell you will hurt. The software, which is most often referred to as an IDE or Integrated Development Environment and allows you to write code for the device and, you know, uses the aforementioned debugger the way it was intended, you know how much it costs? A single license? $3400 or $5700 if you need to test RAM. And guess what? We do, so we had to purchase one of each for a year. And yes, after that year is passed, we need to renew them. So we're looking at what, $12,000 for the two of us to get started with development? Or we would, if not for our distributor, who's been supporting this project from when it was only an idea. I did tell them this is a huge burden for a startup like ours and ask whether it's possible to get some kind of discount. And luckily for us, it was possible. In fact, we got a coupon for 50% off, which despite the fact I still spent thousands of dollars also meant I saved thousands. So I guess my point is, if you're a startup, always ask for discounts because most companies are both prepared to get the question and to offer some. And you know which company also gave us 50% off because we're a startup? Altium. Altium is pretty much the gold standard when it comes to PCB design and if you blindly follow the ordering process on their website, you can easily overpay for the subscription which starts at around 4400 euros per person per year. I have no need for one because I'm not a PCB designer myself and the software luckily comes with a free cloud integration. Well, not free, but you know what I mean. And through this cloud, I can access the designs in my browser in order to discuss them with Aliash, who's leading the PCB design. And one final piece of software that's equally expensive, but luckily for us, completely free for startups the first year is SOLIDWORKS. If Altium is used for the electronic aspects of the device, then SOLIDWORKS is used for the mechanical ones. It's used both by the CETO design the team that's working on the design of the enclosure, as well as my friend Bostian, who owns the CNC shop and advises us on how the actual production of the mechanical parts will look like. SolidWorks then serves as a sort of a glue between us all, because we can all access the same project at the same time, and it also has an integration with Altium, so we'll be able to embed the final PCB into the final mechanical design, and see how it all fits together before we need to manufacture anything. And since we're talking about the design, we already had our third planning meeting with CETO, in which we discussed the UX of the device, or the user experience when it comes to handling of it. They already prepared some mock-ups about port placement, and I must say I like the last one best. First, we have the three USB Type-C ports, one for power delivery, one for UART, which we discussed earlier, and finally, one for the USB drive. Then, we have a reset hole, which visually separates the USB ports from the three RJ45 ports, and lastly, the two SFP Plus ports. I think it makes most sense like this, but I'd love to hear your opinion on the matter. Do you agree, or would you prefer any of the two other arrangements. The next thing we discussed are the two M.2 connectors and where to place them on the PCB. As we'd like the users to be able to swap those out without completely tearing the device apart, 
We figured they should be positioned somewhere on the bottom of the PCB so that you'll be able to take the bottom part of the enclosure off without needing to completely disassemble the device. And finally, we also discuss LEDs or maybe more accurately LED, that is to say one LED. We see absolutely no point in all those blinking lights that most modern routers come with and honestly nobody looks at. In fact, Sito already worked on a similar project before and they did a survey in which they discovered that those blinking lights annoy people rather than help them in any way. So we decided we'll go with one LED that will blink or pulse while the device will be booting and then remain solid in normal operation. But that doesn't mean we forgot about the more advanced users who will want to experiment with the device and have a bit more, let's say, debugging capabilities, which is why we agreed it would make sense to put, to put all these missing LEDs on the PCB itself and have a way to turn them on and off most likely by using a dip switch somewhere near the M.2 slots. Okay, we've covered the technicalities, financials and user experience. So now before we wrap this up, let's also talk about people. If you've been wondering how it's possible that we're nearly done with the schematics, given that we've only just started about a month and a half ago, it's because we onboarded Aliaja's friend Ken to the project. Ken is a specialist in high-speed digital signals and because of that was able to draw RAM, for example, in just a couple of days, because he's done this before. Aliash is perfectly capable of doing this, of course, but since he's never worked with RAM before, when it comes to laying it out on a PCB, that is, the same thing would likely take him a couple of weeks. We've also onboarded another person to help us with the firmware. However, I can't tell much more about them yet, simply because they haven't started yet as of recording of this video. So I'll report more about them next month. These two people, so Ken and the firmware guy, agreed to help us out between 8 and 12 hours per week, which is just the amount of help we need in order to meet our September or October deadline of having the initial prototypes ready and not spend too much money on additional reinforcements. I guess when it comes to hiring people, it's always a balancing act of time, money and speed of development and unfortunately you can rarely have all three. Now before we wrap this up, I should also mention Matei who works for one of the investors as a financial analyst and they've lent him to us to serve as a CFO of sorts. CFO, for those of you who don't know, means Chief Financial Officer and is basically responsible to know how money is made, but for us, more importantly at this stage, how money is spent and then advise the CEO, so me, on what steps make the most sense when it comes both to making more money or to spend less. Matei is offered to us free of charge and we already had the first meeting in which he gave me a homework of creating a financial plan, which unfortunately I haven't gotten to yet, but will be done in the next week or so. That's it. This report is a bit longer than I initially expected. And that's because it's the first one and it probably covers more than just one month. So if you're still watching this, thank you. You're amazing. Click that like button. Thank you. Going forward, I'll do videos like this on a monthly basis and do my best to focus only on the activities of the past month. So don't forget to tune in at the end of June. And just so you don't forget, make sure to subscribe. Tomasz from Slovenia, signing out.